Because it is really Christina's vision and generosity of bringing us all here together every year, but also of making it greater every year. And in a way, I was thinking, preparing the introduction for Arik, I was kind of reminded that it all actually started with Herzog de Meuron. Because even before it, uh, in Basel, one of the very first kind of pre eat conversations Chris, uh, Christina put together was a conversation about the museum involving Herzog de Meuron, Rem Kohlhaas, John Armleder, and many others before then it moved up to the mountains. Of course, Herzog de Meuron uh, are the designers, the architects of the M+. That's the amazing new museum which uh, is going to open soon. And uh, Arik is the lead curator for design and architecture of M+. He is curating, as we speak, a M+ pavilion, which is a prefiguration. Uh, as Johannes Kladers once told me, very often the prefiguration of a new museum is a very exciting period because it's a period of uh, experimentation, and that spirit of experimentation uh, was already there, of course, in uh, Arik's previous work when he was the director, the creative director of the Beijing Design Week. And as such, he introduced us to many amazing designers, to new voices of design from China I was not familiar with, but also showed us an amazing integrity of design, something which is very important, the notion of design which goes beyond slogans, beyond uh, bullet points. He, of course, also um, uh, made us discover lots of you know, emerging young Chinese architects. He once told me about Li Hu, a uh, Chinese architect who connects actually uh, the city and the countryside, brings element of the countryside into the city. If you think about this project of King Road, now where King Road is transformed into the park. Today, actually, Arik prepared a very special new piece which has to do with both fear and love in the countryside, and it has actually also got to do with a recent holiday in the Tibetan part of Sichuan province, very much in the countryside, where we will see that it is not only the countryside, but that there are massive infrastructural projects happening in the countryside, which of course leads us then to that theme which we will discuss also tomorrow with Rem Kohlhaas, with Niklas Mark, and with Emily Siegel. I think there are many connections. Please give a very, very, very warm welcome to Arik. Uh, I think I can do that. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thanks. Thanks, Hans Ulrich, for that very, very nice introduction and, and for inviting me here along with uh, uh, Biche, Philip, and, 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 and Daniel. It's really uh, a great honor to, um, to be among such distinguished company. Um, as Hans Ulrich mentioned, uh, my, the, the, the title of my talk is uh, Fear and Love in the Countryside. I should begin by saying that I, I, I borrowed the first half of that title, Fear and Love, um, from a friend of mine, Justin McGurk, who is the chief curator at the Design Museum in London, uh, who had given that name um, to his first show uh, at, at the museum a couple of years ago. Uh, my talk has nothing to do with that show except for the fact that I liked, uh, I liked the name. Uh, and I like that name because I think it, it expresses a sort of ambivalence that, that, that Philip was talking about, uh, the sort of um, uh, opposing uh, emotions that uh, often simultaneously uh, exist when we think of uh, the countryside uh, and nature. Um, when I got the invitation to be here, the speaker brief uh, seemed to encourage us to experiment with formats, uh, even saying that we could do performances if we wanted. Uh, I'm going to assure you I won't be doing a performance. Uh, that's a bit uh, outside of my comfort zone. Uh, but I am uh, going to push myself a little bit, uh, like Claudia, by beginning with a, a, a bit of a, a personal, uh, a somewhat confessional story, uh, starting with a highly embarrassing uh, childhood photo. <laughs> This is uh, me in uh, around probably 1979. And I thought of this recently because I, uh, a few months ago I was uh, in Chicago where I grew up uh, visiting my mother and she had, pulled this, she had put this photo out. Um, I knew I was going to be doing this talk and this, and, and, and this photo struck me because it seemed, uh, it just hit me that, uh, that, it, that it seemed as if from a very young age I was already being sort of groomed uh, for nature. I mean, you, I, I'm here in this sort of uh, lumberjack flannel shirt, uh, backgrounded by this very uh, bucolic, idyllic, uh, uh, autumnal foliage uh, scene. When uh, the fact of the matter is, when I was a kid, and I've, I've evolved uh, since then, but when I was a kid, uh, just the very thought of nature terrified me. I, uh, to, to me, nature was this uh, mysterious, sort of scary uh, unknown that I associated with, uh, with discomfort and mosquitoes and dirt and uh, all sorts of unnecessary physical uh, e exertions. Uh, 
Um, when I was, uh, uh, as a child, I mean, uh, while, while all my friends were, were, were going to these really fun uh, or even exotic places on, on holiday, uh, unfortunately, my parents were obsessed with uh, the, the classic uh, great American road trip and, and, and seeing the countryside. So they would always drag me uh, across the American West to some of the places that, 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 that Claudia's been, uh, though I think she was much happier there than I was. Um, <laughs> They would uh, really want to give me the full countryside experience. Uh, we would, of course, stay in a lot of roadside motels. Uh, we would uh, sometimes stay at, at, on farms, where my stepfather would uh, gleefully reminisce about how his mother uh, used to love the smell of horse manure, which I thought was the most <laughs> repulsive thing you could ever imagine. And then, to, if, as if things couldn't get worse, uh, one year my parents uh, bought a tent. And, uh, <laughs> That really offended my sensibilities because at the time I was a firm believer in progress. Uh, in my view, <laughs> in my view, we as a species had spent so many millennia trying to overcome, uh, overcome hardships and, and nature to, to move beyond the tent. I didn't understand why my parents were forcing me to go back to it. And of course, there's this very American sort of angle uh, to this, uh, in this notion of manifest destiny, which was a 19th century kind of mythology uh, that, that, that sort of justified and, and, and promoted the, the conquering uh, of, of, of the uh, North American continent uh, by the new American nation. Uh, of course, regardless of the, regardless uh, or, or never mind the, uh, the indigenous peoples that were, were already there, but you can see this uh, in this very famous, po uh, uh, very famous painting uh, called American Progress, where you see uh, the allegory of Columbia, you know, uh, re uh, representing the, the, the young nation, uh, leading the charge ever westward, bringing knowledge and civilization, uh, stringing uh, telegraph wires uh, and, and, and railroads across the great continent. And I, I think there are um, some correlations, I'm going to come back to this in a second, uh, there are some correlations to uh, what's happening uh, in China now. I said, um, well, maybe just to continue the story, in, in 2008, uh, I was living in New York, and I just sort of, uh, for no good reason at all, just picked up and left and moved to Beijing. Uh, I sort of consider that my, my, my first midlife crisis, I, I, I guess. But then, uh, uh, soon after that, uh, I wound up in Hong Kong, which is where uh, I am now, working for M+. Uh, I have... I have overcome a lot of my discomfort with, with nature, oh, excuse me, um, and uh, perhaps even learned uh, to embrace it. And, and, uh, and perhaps it's a cliche that as a sort of middle-aged, uh, a middle-aged man who's, who's spent uh, much of his life so far working very hard, uh, I've uh, come to that point in life where I uh, am you know, searching for something in search of the countryside. And so we've been uh, going on holiday more recently to uh, much more sort of uh, re remote places. And this past year, um, uh, my partner and I had wanted to go to Tibet uh, over the sort of Christmas New Year holiday. Tibet, as you may know, is a, a somewhat sensitive place, uh, and it got too complicated to, to make the arrangements uh, in the short amount of time we had. So we instead opted for uh, Sichuan province, which is a, a central province in China, best known for its spicy food and, and pandas. Uh, but on, uh, you'll see its western border runs along Tibet, and that is uh, very historically uh, Tibetan. Uh, Tibetan area. Now, so what were we in search of? I said we're in search of the countryside. Well, again, this is, a, uh, this is where I, 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 I'm falling in, into cliches. We were, of course, in search of nature. There are these beautiful mountains, and uh, we were doing some, uh, some hiking. This is in, in, the, in, in the Yading Nature Preserve. Uh, probably a bit too much hiking uh, for, for my taste, but it was still uh, wonderful non, 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 nonetheless. Uh, we were looking for, in search of country life, these beautiful Tibetan villages with their whitewashed, rammed earth uh, houses. And uh, we would just sort of stop in uh, where, where, when there were no restaurants, we would just sort of knock on, the, uh, knock on the door of a house, and it was very customary there for them to just uh, uh, pre prepare lunch for you. They would just sort of share their food, and it was just a really wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. Uh, the culture, Tibetan culture, obviously, uh, is, is incredibly uh, seductive and compelling. Uh, the area is dotted with, uh, with, with old monasteries. Um, as it happens, this is a monastery uh, called, called Bampo, uh, outside the, the, the town of uh, Daocheng. And uh, I actually lost my wallet there uh, for, for the first time in 20 years, but it was uh, such a magical place that I, I really took it as, as a sort of reminder you know, about, uh, about finding salvation through relinquishing material attachments, and so it didn't... <laughs> 
it, 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 it didn't bother me at all. I was, I was, I was really, uh, that, that, that was the sort of power that this place uh, exerted on me. I was, actually felt quite liberated not having credit cards or ID cards or, or all that stuff. Um, but while we were doing all this, uh, the, 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 what was perhaps uh, even more uh, apparent, what was totally unavoidable, was the amount of uh, infrastructure that we saw, uh, new infrastructure that we, uh, we saw being, uh, being built throughout this uh, rather remote, uh, uh, quote unquote, uh, remote countryside. You see uh, power lines, sort of this web of power lines extending as far as the eye can see. Uh, we saw quite a number of, of dams, new, uh, new dams being built, uh, trains, um, train lines, roads, uh, tunnels. I, I, I think in, in Switzerland you, you recently opened or completed the world's longest tunnel. And I, 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 from, from what I saw, uh, uh, the, the western Sichuan province will be giving you a run for your money because some of those, those, those tunnels that, that we went through uh, were, were, were really uh, really, uh, really impressive, uh, impressively long, and um, uh, and and yet there were no, and yet there was no major city uh, anywhere to be seen. I mean, this is sort of uh, uh, really a sort of a, more of a sign of things to come than uh, than than filling an, any sort of need. Uh, massive bridges. I mean, here we're about. Uh, eight or nine miles from the nearest town. I mean, not not even a major city, but 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 from the nearest town, and uh, this all this all this building going on um, uh, has uh, has of course a, 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 a much broader context. Uh, I'm I'm sure uh, all of you are somehow aware of China uh, by now and 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 uh, and, and its rapid. Uh, development and growth over the past few, few decades. Uh, most of that development has been concentrated on the uh, East Coast, uh, creating a very large gap uh, in, in wealth and development be between the East Coast and the uh, inner central uh, and uh, Western provinces. Um, the government has been investing very heavily in trying to sort of close that gap with these large uh, infrastructure projects. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, fitting this into the uh, sort of broader Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, many of you may have heard of, where China is uh, planning to invest uh, about a trillion dollars, uh, a trillion U.S. dollars in, uh, in infrastructure projects linking China with uh, Europe through Central Asia, Africa, and and and, and beyond. Um, this is um, a big. Uh, this is an economic and, uh, development and trade uh, project. This is a project also about uh, China's growing geopolitical geopolitical ambitions. Uh, it's also a project uh, about excess capacity. There's a lot of excess capacity in steel and concrete and other things in China. And so this, all, so this um, is a way of kind of using, uh, using all of it. Now, what is this doing in the countryside? Uh, it's, of course, transforming the countryside physically. Uh, but uh, when you uh, put this in combination with the development of the soft infrastructure of the internet, uh, it, it gets even more interesting. Um, China now has over 800 million uh, internet users. Uh, it, it, and it's really incredible how, how pervasive uh, uh, the technology has, uh, has become. Uh, in this remote, you know, I, I told you I, I, I lost my wallet, but in some ways it, it didn't matter because even in the smallest towns and villages and the smallest restaurants uh, and shops, uh, ev everyone accepted WeChat Pay, which is the, the sort of uh, common uh, form of online payment or mobile, uh, uh, mobile payment uh, in, in, in China. And you see, uh, uh, you see this absolutely transforming the countryside. Uh, there's a thing called Taobao, uh, which is sort of like uh, the common China's answer to eBay and Amazon uh, combined. It's, it's, it's the biggest e-commerce platform uh, in, in the world now. Uh, on a single day, uh, on November 11th last year, which is a sort of shopping holiday. It started out as a sort of anti-Valentine's Day, but it's, it's become a shopping holiday. Uh, on one single day last year, uh, $25 billion worth of uh, activity w uh, went through Taobao. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a pretty massive, uh, massive thing. And what it's been able to do now is also connect, uh, connect small villages and towns into the uh, broader Chinese and, 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 and global economy. What you see here is an image of one of the uh, more than 16,000 Taobao rural service centers that have been opened in villages and, and towns throughout China that are, are act as places where villagers can kind of ship and pick up all the packages, uh, uh, all, the, all, 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 all the products and other things that they are buying uh, via, via Taobao. 
what this has also done is it's uh, enabled a kind of uh, reverse migration. Uh, for over the past few decades, uh, approximately 350 million people uh, have moved from uh, the countryside of China to the cities, uh, in, usually in search of uh, uh, work. Uh, and. And, and at first, it was certainly mostly ma uh, manufacturing work. And what's been happening in, in recent years is having got, had this experience in the uh, factories of eastern China, a lot of villagers are now uh, moving back to their home uh, hometowns uh, to create uh, workshops and factories. And with Taobao and with the sort of developing uh, shipping uh, infrastructure, uh, they're allowed. Uh, they're they're now able to uh, open up workshops, factories to produce. To, uh, Different goods and, re and begin to kind of repopulate and um, and uh, uh, transform the economies of these uh, of, of these small villages, which had been uh, in uh, in seemingly inexorable decline. Now, when you hear about uh, Taobao, uh, you know, revitalizing these these rural economies, you kind of think of these these uh, th these very charming activities like like apples. You know, you you can imagine um, the villagers going back and uh, with, with all the food safety concerns in China, uh, filling uh, filling a growing demand for organic uh, fruits and vegetables, and, and 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 that kind of thing is happening. Uh, you also have this image of, uh, of the sort of craft economy, sort of the, like the, the, the Etsy uh, of, of version of, of, of China. And, uh, and indeed, uh, this is happening as well. But what is more prevalent uh, is that most of these factories are producing things like furniture, uh, 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 clothing, and, and, and the sort of typical uh, industrial manu industrially manufactured goods that, that, that the big factories on the East Coast used to make. Uh, and that is transforming uh, these towns uh, into, uh, into, in, into cities. Uh, this is an image I borrowed from Stefan Peterman uh, and his colleagues at uh, AMA, which is the research uh, arm of OMA, the firm most closely associated with uh, Rem Koolhaas, who is going to be speaking tomorrow. Um, uh, Stefan here went to a town called Dongfang in Jiangsu province, which was uh, which is considered the first Taobao village uh, in, in, in China. And um, uh, it, it started with just, it, it, was a, it, it was a village of mostly farmers and, and a, few, uh, a few pig breeders and, uh, a, a, and a waste recycling plant. Uh, but soon there, were, uh, there was one Taobao uh, sort of factory, uh, then there were three, and now there are 16,000 uh, Taobao factories in this a uh, small village, and uh, this here is a model of the uh, of Dongfang's master plan for a massive uh, industrial park that's uh, set to begin construction this year. So Dongfang is the kind of place where um, very few of us will probably uh, ever visit. Um, but uh, you know, I think the extent to which people like you and 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 and, and me uh, sort of think of the countryside, it's it's more of a sort of lifestyle uh, thing. We're we're sort of again in, in search of this uh, this 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 bucolic uh, alternative to these 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 sort of busy lives that uh, that we lead in the city. And certainly in China, there is a growing phenomenon of uh, of redeveloping and revitalizing the countryside for people uh, like us. Uh, a lot of China's greatest young architects are, 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 are being called to the countryside uh, these days uh, to, to design projects that, uh, for, for, for tourism of, of, of all sorts, uh, agritourism, cultural tourism, and, uh, and so on. Uh, there are many, many such projects now uh, where, where there, you're seeing hotels and museums and, 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 and sort of craft villages uh, sort of popping up there. They're all sort of different, uh, taking their own uh, uh, representing the, the entire range of, of, of revitalization strategies. But I'm going to focus on this one project, which I happened to, to visit uh, in December, just one month before we, we went to the, the, the Tibetan part of China. And, and, and it's a new project by a Shanghai uh, studio called Arca Union, um, founded by an architect named Philip Yuan. It's called In Bamboo. It's in Zhuli, a small village about an hour from Chengdu, the, the capital of Sichuan. As you can see, it's uh, nicely sited in, in the countryside. Uh, in a part of um, uh, part of Sichuan where they grow wheat and 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 uh, rapeseed, but also uh, there's a, a very very strong bamboo craft tradition here. You'll see this building is. Uh, really remarkably, remarkably defined by its digitally generated figure eight kind of Mobius-like roof. 
It's a community center, but a very flexible one, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, uh, using uh, vernacular materials like local, sort of local roof tiles that, uh, uh, that have been uh, traditional to the area. Um, they use uh, the space for, uh, for bamboo weaving, uh, which is, uh, again, uh, v v has a very long tradition in this part of uh, Sichuan. A part of the, the, the walls here are, are, are clad in this sort of uh, caned weaving pattern that, uh, that residents specialize in. Uh, they do exhibitions here. They do. Um, uh, they do. There's a restaurant. They do talks and conferences, uh, and so on and so forth. It's part of a much bigger plan uh, that's going to see a small hotel, like six villas. Uh, there, uh, eventually, a, a summer camp uh, will also be built for children. There is going to be a public toilet that will have a uh, a a uh, a. Um, a uh, parcel delivery stop uh, attached to it. So as I was saying, the Julie will now be uh, connected to the, the, the new Taobao uh, economy as well. Uh, and also some other interventions in the nearby by village, which I, I, I won't go into. But here you really get a sense of this, uh, of the beautiful form making that was involved in this project too. Uh, Arca Union, Arca Union, Arca Union, excuse me, is uh, it is known for its computer uh, computer generated uh, design and fabrication experiments. Uh, here is this is you, you can see this incredible sloping roof and these these uh, parabolic parametric shapes, um, all designed on the computer, uh, but also all uh, uh, fabricated using or mostly fabricated using CNC milling and other uh, digitally enabled. Uh, technologies uh, and, uh, leading the architects to declare uh, this project as an example of rural area prefab industrialization in the era of digital humanities. So that's a real mouthful, and it's a lot to <laughs> and it's a lot to take in. Uh, and uh, but uh, it, and it speaks to the efficiency of the Chinese language uh, that <laughs> that you can squeeze all these concepts together in one uh, in, in one sentence. But uh, as oxymoronic as it sounds, I think this actually is a really poignant um, uh, articulation of this, sort of, of this sort of hybrid condition uh, in, in which we uh, see ourselves when it comes to the rural and the non-rural, um, uh, the, the, the digital and the humanistic, uh, the, the industrial and the non-industrial. Um, this, this is a project that's meant to be a, a sort of prototype of a kind of mass customization. China has a massive countryside with, you know, pro with 600 million people in it still and 600,000 villages. How do, you, uh, how do you tackle all of them at once? You can't. Uh, and so I think the, the proposition here is that by using uh, digital uh, technology and fabrication, you, you're able to sort of uh, uh, customize projects at, at a much larger scale than ever before. This project was, was, un, was done on a very low budget. Budget, and it was uh, constructed and built in only 52 days. So it's uh, including the landscape and, and, and interior. So it's, it's, it's really a fascinating, uh, uh, again, a, a fascinating proposition. Now I'm going to end uh, my talk just on a few random broader thoughts. I, I think I'm, I'm way out of time. Um, just to sort of remind, uh, remind us that you know, our, our concept of nature, I mean, Philip had, had quoted uh, Smithson. Uh, earlier as, as defining nature as, a, as an 18th and 19th century fiction. I mean, nature is a construct and it, and has, been a very, uh, it, it, it has been constructed in different ways across culture through, throughout, different, uh, throughout, uh, throughout history. Um, this, the, class, the classic textbook uh, uh, example of this is, is, is a comparison of, of, of gardens. You know, you have the, 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 the uh, which gives us a very, a very blunt way of, of, of looking at this. Uh, you have this sort of classic Italian Renaissance garden and then the French garden, which was very formal. It's about sort of expressing, drawing from Alberti, expressing, or try, trying to apply ration, uh, rational order uh, to the landscape and eventually sort of uh, embodying our, our control and mastery of, of nature. You have the English garden with its uh, romantic, uh, with its romantic idol, but yet highly constructed as well. You have the, the Chinese garden, this sort of microcosmic uh, representation of, 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 the, of the universe and, and, and the individual's relationship, uh, contemplative uh, relationship with nature. Now, these uh, all show different ways of conceiving of nature, but what's happening at a time now when uh, we, are, we, are, we are actually changing the, the, the very facts of, of, of nature? And I will just maybe zip, 
through these, these, these three sort of quick, quick projects. Um, this is a project by the artist Kelly uh, Jadzak, who with the scientists Patricia Corcoran and Charles Moore uh, a few years ago started collecting these very strange agglomerations that began appearing on the beaches of, of, of Hawaii. And what this is is essentially uh, 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 waste plastic on the beach that had been uh, melted and combined inadvertently uh, with with rocks and other uh, grains and uh, grains of sand and other sort of detritus to create these new sort of quasi minerals that um, that will probably be with us uh, for a long time. So if we're talking about human versus post-human, uh, I think we can also wonder uh, uh, what this says about nature versus uh, versus post-nature. Going back to this notion of the Anthropocene. Uh, uh, by which uh, there is this discussion that we have changed uh, the planet so much uh, and, and altered even the geological record so much that, uh, that we've now entered a, a new epoch uh, called the Anthropocene. Um, so does this have, does this have uh, implications for, uh, for how we see nature and also what we make of nature and how we even define the beauty of nature? Kashif was talking about that uh, in, in, in his talk. Uh, a project by Studio Swine, I think, lends a little bit of, uh, of, of insight in, into that. A number of years ago, we all, know, we all know by now about ocean plastics and how, how serious a problem it is. A number of years ago, uh, Studio Swine, a London studio, uh, set out to these very, various gyres in the oceans, these sort of uh, swirls uh, created by the, uh, the ocean currents that have become these, these massive uh, agglomerations of, of, of floating plastic. Uh, they created a thing called a... Uh, uh, a, uh, what do they call a solar extruder, which is basically a parabolic uh, mirror that collects the rays from the sun, which then melts, uh, can melt plastic and then shape it into other forms. And they went on this boat, collected some of these ocean plastics, used this solar extruder to create new objects. This is an evolution uh, of that, this beautiful sort of tortoise shell made from these plastics that they collected from the ocean. Uh, leading us to wonder if, you know, at a time when we're talking about the sixth extinction, uh, so to speak, and at a time when, uh, you know, species like turtles, sea turtles, are, are under threat by, uh, can, we, can we recreate them using the very materials that are, uh, that are in, endangering them? Um, are, we, are, are we sort of destined to, uh, to reconstruct nature uh, using the uh, waste of our own, uh, of our own activity? And then finally, uh, a project by the uh, also uh, London-based duo of Revital Cohen and Tor Van Balen. Uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce the name of this, uh, but it's, it's uh, uh, we all know uh, we we all know that um, you know these these things that we rely on so much nowadays uh, rely themselves on all sorts of horrible things uh, that happen behind the scenes, and whether whether it's sort of rare earth mining or exploitation of labor, uh, and, and and so on and so forth. And what Revital and Tour did uh, in 2000 or started doing in 2014 was they uh, found a, uh, a factory in Amsterdam that was going bankrupt, and they uh, bought up all the sort of office machines and, and, and electronics from that factory, and began pulling all, those, uh, uh, all of these gadgets uh, apart to reverse mine uh, the, the rare earth and other minerals that were used to make them. So they were basically literally extract, re, uh, unextracting the extracted minerals that went into making these uh, these these uh, uh, products to reverse engineer the process of their manufacture. And then they would recombine these minerals uh, into uh, these crystals that then re uh, put them back in their quote unquote natural state. And um, you know, this of course tells us that, that, that in some ways, hard as we, we try, uh, there is no such thing as undoing. You know, uh, what, what, what we've done cannot be undone. But, um, but, uh, but is there a way uh, perhaps in this case to find a kind of uh, ambivalent uh, beauty in it. So thank you. Eric, thank you so, so much. And before we open it up to the many questions I'm sure you have for Eric, I wanted to ask you one thing. When we worked uh, in the 90s on Cities on the Move, which yeah. was the exhibition I did with Hu Han Ru on Asian art and urbanism. We went, you know, many, many times to, to China. And it was actually Wang Zhan Wei, who was one of the first kind of artists 
who pointed out this sort of oscillation between the city and the countryside. But we also met someone called U Ning quite early yes. on. Uh, and U Ning, who then was in the art and music world, has since then you know, become very well known for a reconstruction movement, a rural reconstruction movement. He sort of founded the Bishan Commune, uh, and it's seemingly a project which has really bothered the government. It created a lot of tension. He had to go to exile to the United States. So I thought it would be interesting, because I never completely understood the kind of context uh, about this project and to which extent, because it had all to do with reintroducing the rule, to which, to which extent that caused a problem for the government. It would just be great yeah. to hear more about Uning. Yeah, well, I'll, I, I can, I'm not an expert on this, so, but, but, but I, I, I can probably say a little bit. Um, you know, owning, uh, like many people, uh, has, uh, has a, uh, often says that uh, if you want to find the real China, uh, you go to the countryside. That's, that's sort of a, a, a trope that's, that, that's developed, and I, uh, I, 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 I've never been exactly sure what, uh, what, what's, what's meant, meant by that, but I think there is a sense that uh, there is a kind of primal uh, Chineseness that, 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 that exists from, or that, 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 that's very much tied to the rural roots of, of, of the country. Now, um, yeah, Owning became very uh, interested in this rural reconstruction movement uh, quite a number of years ago, and he uh, started this this commune in, in Bishan, which which I've been to, and it's it's really quite quite quite, quite beautiful. Um, for him, where he started to get in a little bit of uh, trouble with uh, was when he uh, was he was associating. Um, rural reconstruction with uh, with a kind of strand of anarchism uh, that that he was uh, promoting, and uh, as you can imagine, the Communist Party of China is not comfortable with anarchism, uh, and especially uh, in a country that's very aware of. Uh, the fact that its revolutions have historically all begun in the countryside, uh, you, you can imagine uh, th th that he ran into trouble, which is uh, how he wound up in the United States. But uh, he has been back. Uh, I, I, I believe he was actually in, back in Bishan uh, not so long ago. Another question uh, was actually, you know, you showed us uh, so many things in your talk, and that was kind of very exciting things. Also, you know, of course, positions of uh, younger designers who address the topics of the Anthropocene. I was kind of wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how these exciting themes are going to enter the collection of M+. Because I was very fascinated uh, to read, for example, that you're acquiring for the collection, you know, not only traditional design objects, but very unorthodox things. For example, you acquired this very famous Japanese uh, sushi bar, <laughs> which is going to you know, be part of the collection. Of course, you know, ever since uh, Philip Johnson did the famous machine exhibition at MoMA, where he put these uh, objects, which are actually not considered to be design masterpieces, but which are kind of you know, items like ready-mades. It was very Duchampian, ready-mades of the design age. He put them kind of on plinths, and suddenly, you know, they became, you know, design exhibits. Ever since, there is, of course, a notion of expanded, you know, sense of the design museum. Paolo Antonelli at MoMA is, in an exemplary way, pushing this boundary and acquiring things we would never have thought of as design a few years ago. It's, I mean, Boris talked about an expanded notion of art, and that could be an expanded notion of design. So I'm just curious how we're going to bring this, and particularly these Anthropocene-related things, into, into M+. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in some ways you know, being a, a, a new museum in a, a part of the world where design is some, still somewhat nascent discipline. I mean, uh, there, there, there's a downside to that in that we, we, uh, there's a, a lot of work to do to sort of really build a foundation for a devel the development of a, a, a bigger, stronger discourse uh, around design. But the upside is that we don't have as much baggage, uh, perhaps, as, as, as other places do about what design is and, how, what, and, 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 and so on. So I think we can be a little, we are a bit more flexible and fluid <laughs> With what we are able to, to collect and what we're able to call design, we don't uh, we don't have these sort of rigid categories uh, that, that that we have to fight all the time. So we um, collect everything from you know, a sushi bar to sort of a duck to um, uh, we do have the original emojis uh, as, as as well to to, to all sorts of uh, a documentation of processes for social practices and so on and so forth. Now for this Anthropocene stuff, you bring up a really interesting point because uh, these these works, like the last uh, two especially that I showed you, these are more examples of kind of critical design. You know, it's not meant to be used. It's really meant to sort of make us think and, and, and provoke and, and, and sort of posit potentially new, uh, speculate uh, new, new, new practices. Um, there's a, a strong, uh, under, the strong undercurrent of criti criticality, however, I think translates differently um, uh, in, in our part of the world versus perhaps uh, this part of the world. Uh, and when it comes to nature, 
because I think nature has always has been ha, is a different construct uh, in China, let's say, than it has been uh, has been here. Uh, sometimes the, the, that criticality may not have the same edge uh, in China as it might here, and I, I think the, the the edge here I think relates also to a little relates also to a little bit about what, what Philip was talking about in terms of this notion of, of nature as um, uh, this sort of Western notion of nature as a kind of pure uh, pure thing, and, and and I think in China it, it, it's never had that uh, that association. Thank you very much. Do we have questions for Arik? Yeah, there's a question here. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Ari, thank you so much for that very eloquent talk. It just reminded me, especially the last slides at the end, and I guess that's what you're trying to tell us, that although China's moved 300 million people out of poverty and constructed cities like no tomorrow, um, we're reminded of Slavo Zizek's uh, comment that if we really love nature, then we should sit in front of a garbage pile and really adore what we see, because as you know, uh, it's our nature, it's what humans have produced, is garbage, right? So, um, my, yeah, my, maybe the question is, um, do you believe that those few slides at the end are kind of indicating a criticality, criticality about the way we are constructing new natures? Well, I think they're definitely proposing, um, uh, they're definitely proposing that we begin redefining how we define nature. And, 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 and that, I think, I, I think Rem uh, has, has written a little bit about how the, the transformation of, of the country study is going to force us to uh, discover a new sublime. Right? And, and, and I think by, by, by making these, these, these objects, uh, uh, which are coming from such a disturbing, uh, which has such a disturbing backstory uh, to them, but, 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 but uh, making them quite, quite beautiful, and in a way where we're almost being asked to, to adjust our expectations and to cope uh, and to sort of maybe re recalibrate uh, how we see nature versus artifice, beauty versus ugliness. And uh, yeah. Uh, did, did, did I answer your question? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Pick up the microphone here. Thank you. Uh, China obviously has been like the driving force in the urbanization of the past decades and in forging this paradigm that the city is the place to go, right? Um, now it has come to a point where the cities have stopped to almost break, I mean, in terms of environmental conditions, smog becomes increasingly severe in Chinese cities, and the Chinese government now steers against that quite, quite forcefully through the introduction of electrical um, mobiles, for instance, uh, um, cars, for instance. Do you think that after sort of kind of, um, you know, pushing the cities so much, China could be the first country in the 21st century that actually repopularizes the countryside as a habitat for, for our like exploding populations in the sense that it introduces a kind of, let's say, sustainable sprawl idea. Is that, is that feasible? Is this, is this like actually a political strategy? You know, I think um, you know it, what's interesting about China is that multiple strategies are, are always being pursued at once. You know, like I, I think what China is dealing with is totally unprecedented. So, so, so there is no sort of boilerplate, uh, and so. Uh, there are multiple things happening at once. On, on, on the one hand, you have uh, the continuing uh, uh, growth of the mega city. You know, now there have been plan there there are plans now to combine the cities of Tianjin, Beijing, and an entirely new city from scratch called uh, uh, Xiong'an uh, into one sprawling. Uh, sprawling mega city of I, I don't know how many tens of millions of people I, I, I can't I, I can't re remember in Hong Kong uh, we're being integrated into this the, the new Greater Bay Area which includes uh, quite a number of cities in the Pearl River Delta but that are now being connected uh, into what will be an, an urban agglomeration of more than 65 70 million people. On the other hand, uh, you are seeing all this uh, attention being shifted to the uh, to the the, the countryside. Um, and uh, and that's being uh, again enabled by by the internet and and these massive uh, infrastructure programs, uh, like uh, like Dongfang, that 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 Taobao village that, uh, that 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 I was showing you. Um, 
what's, what's, uh, what, what's interesting, what will be interesting to watch is that one of the main impetuses in recent years for really pushing urbanization in China uh, is that the government believes that that's, that's the best way to sort of shift the economy from low-cost manufacturing to sort of services and consumption. And the, the idea being that uh, people in cities consume more, you know, uh, uh, you uh, and 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 and, and uh, increasing internal consumption has been a real, a real, really big goal of the government. Now, with Taobao and again these these uh, uh, Taobao ur uh, rural service centers and so on and so forth, it's becoming much easier now to consume in the countryside. Um, so whether or not the sort of uh, that, that that drive to urbanize uh, being being sort of justified by 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 by, um, by uh, wanting to promote consumption when consumption is already growing in the countryside, what, what, whether that continues or not is is will be uh, interesting to watch. We can also see actually more and more art projects happening in the countryside. Yeah. I mean, uh, for example, the Zheng um, uh, Gugu kind of you know Gesamtkunstwerk, which. Yeah the countryside and the vitamin yeah, uh, space, which has to do with farming and the countryside. Liang Xiaodong, the painter who does plenarism, you know, yeah. and paints rural paintings. So it seems to be also reflected in the art world, no? Yeah, and, and a lot of these, these villages, when they are planning their kind of revitalization projects, they are actually building uh, art spaces into these, these plants. I mean, the, the, the question is always how you fill it, but yeah. And then there's all these, all these biennials now popping up as well in, in, in these towns that no one or very few had, uh, had heard of until now. There could not be a better conclusion. Thank you so much. And please give a very, very big round of applause for Arik Chan. Thank you, Hans-Eric.